All right. Welcome, everybody, to the CS Leadership Roundtable. I'm Andrew Marks, co-founder of Success Hacker and the Success Coaching Training Program. We're back for our monthly live leadership roundtable today, talking about how to educate your organization on the mission of your customer success team. This free learning event is brought to you by Success Coaching, the world leader in customer success professional development training, now with more than 12,000 students globally on our platform. Our training programs are available in a variety of formats from self-paced online learning to virtual instructor-led boot camps. Uh, We're now accepting registrations for our spring 12-week live coaching programs that are being offered in conjunction with the University of San Francisco School of Management. Our level one cohort actually is nearly sold out. I think we, we have two seats left, which is amazing. We also have a growing number of standalone courses taught by industry experts, including data-driven decision-making, having difficult conversations, change management for customer success, outcome-based selling, and what successful managers do, a 12-week management training and coaching program, kicking off our new customer success leadership training track. To find out more about our training programs, uh, go to successcoaching.co. Ashley's going to drop a link in the chat. Thank you, Ashley. For those of you who haven't participated in one of these before, this is a live and unscripted discussion where we dig into a single topic relevant to customer success leaders. Regardless of the company that you work for, the scope of your role, or the sizes of of customers your team deals with, we aim to pick topics that are going to be practical and useful to you. The schedule for our upcoming CS Leadership Roundtable events can also be found at successcoaching.co under the events tab. A few housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is recorded and we'll be posting a replay along with a transcription on our website early next week. We will be taking questions later on during the webinar, so please use that Q&A button found at the bottom of your screen to ask or upvote a question, and also please keep all commentary to the chat window. There's a lot of thought leadership out there, along with a lot of theories about how to deliver customer success. In this series, we focus on the practical real-world advice, best practices, techniques, and shared experiences from those practicing and leading customer success teams on a daily basis. And to do that, we invite three panelists to join me for a roundtable discussion. These are people who are great at their craft, and we ask them to share their experiences and their perspectives. So without further ado, I'd like our panelists to introduce themselves to y'all, talk a bit about who they are and what they do. As usual, in alphabetical order, let's start with Audrey. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew, for having me back. And I'm super excited to be part of today's panel. Hi, everyone. My name is Audrey Vandenbroek. I am the Vice President of Customer Success and Inside Sales at Issue. I've been part of that family for almost five years now. And Issue is a digital publishing platform built for content creators to transform PDFs into embeddable flipbooks, social stories, and graphics. And again, this topic is near and dear to my heart, and I'm excited to get started. Awesome. Thanks, Audrey. Uh, now on to Michael. Hey, folks. Mike Redboard. Pleasure to be here today. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, I've been in customer success for over a decade, spent uh, some of that time at a company called HubSpot, scaling and building out that team. And then more recently at a startup called SaaSworks, uh, which is really helping the analysis component of understanding your revenue for customer success uh, and folks trying to grow scaling subscription businesses. Very, very excited to be here today uh, to talk about mission, collaboration, and everything in between. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. And last but not least, Peter. Thank you, Andrew. And hello, everybody. I am Peter Armley, and I am the Vice President of Customer Success at ESG. Uh, very quickly, ESG is uh, customer success as a service. That's the trademarked um, tagline. And what the company provides is uh, maturity assessments for customer success organizations, a variety of kind of related services around that. Um, they provide staffing, uh, recruiting, training for uh, customer success organizations. And finally, um, they will assess and deploy and optimize technology stacks for customer success. I recently joined ESG. This is actually my second week. I most recently at Oracle for about five years, part of the Center of Excellence for Customer Success, with a particular focus on building out the enablement programs for customer success managers. And I'm thrilled to be here with all of you on the panel. 
Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. And once again, congratulations on the, the new role at, uh, at ESG. Uh, and thanks to you all for making time for us today. Uh, so now let's get to the discussion. Uh, I'm going to be frank for a moment. Not that I'm ever not frank. Some people just don't get it. I hear from folks in the customer success community all the time that their peers on other teams just don't understand the importance and the value that a customer success team brings to the table. Just the, in the last week, I've gotten a number of requests to help develop the messaging for leaders and even to record a TED Talk type of discussion about the value that customer success brings. And, and this situation manifests itself not just in the conversations and the communications that we have with others, but in their actions, which tend to speak louder than words. Every time marketing develops a persona in a silo that doesn't represent the true ideal customer profile based on the experiences of a customer-facing team, each one of those sales deals closed with misset, ex expect, uh, misset customer expectations. I know that that never happens, right? Uh, every time an internal stakeholder conveys an attitude that the customer success team is really the everything team. Customer success is at the vanguard of transformation for companies and their customers. It's so important that we are continuously and effectively raising awareness and communicating the value that we're bringing to our customers and our organization. You can't be a truly successful and impactful CS leader without being good at explaining the value that you and your team bring to the table, which is what we're here to talk about today. So, where should we get started on this? I'll, I'll jump in here, um, Andrew. And uh, thanks for that really great setup. I think it was uh, really well uh, constructed in terms of uh, the argument for, for why um, it's important to really understand how to evangelize the mission and make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, you know, the way I see it, customer success is really the embodiment of this expression, customer centricity within an organization. Um, and, you know, someone needs to take the lead on that, some entity, and, you know, but it can't do it on its own. Customer success cannot do the job of customer success on its own, ironically. It needs other organizations to fulfill their respective missions in order to drive the successful outcomes for customers. And, and so it's, it's critical that um, customer success, success leaders really try really hard to tie in their own mission of customer success with the corporate mission. And what I mean by that is if it's, if it's clear that there's a, a direct correlation between the corporate mission and customer success mission, it's really hard for those other organization leaders to kind of dispute that or, or argue with you or debate you on that because it's a clear connection and they should also be buying into that corporate mission too. So I think I would recommend just to kind of kick this off is that customer success leaders get really good at making sure that the communication they're doing is consistently tying into that corporate mission, making sure that it's tying into the right uh, points that everyone kind of resonates with. All the executive leaders have all bought off and signed off on that. You know, that, that would be a great way to kind of start pushing the envelope around, making sure everyone's kind of working together for customer success. And that's, it, it, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Andre. I was just gonna add, I mean, customer is in our title, it's in our department name, it's in our org name, and if, we don't embrace it as customer success professionals, it'll be hard for the rest of the organization to get on that same journey with you. So being able to understand what it is you're trying to achieve as an organization, <clears throat> as a CS organization is, to, is crucial. And having buy-in from your immediate team members is also crucial in that because you can't convey the mission of CS alone. You can't be the only advocate. You could be the primary champion for sure, but you need your team to also buy in about what their role and their mission is as individual contributors. So I would also suggest getting buy-in from your internal team to also be the internal advocates is also crucial in all of this. Yeah, I, I really think it's it's both of those, right? At the same time, and that's actually the needle to the thread that makes this topic interesting and sophisticated, right? You both need to carry the flag of the customer and carry it high and, and wave it arguably louder than everybody else, right? At the same time, you need to speak the same language 
as the rest of the company so that they can understand, you know, it's not just, hey, we're the team that talks to customers, we're the everything team, we're just like the customer people over here. They can understand the actual business value and the way that that customer team is going to integrate with the rest of the business with the same goals that the entire business has, that the sales team has, that the product team has. Needs to speak that same language mission-wise as other teams, but also be really customer centric. And to me, that's the needle that, you know, we have to thread as leaders. And when you do that successfully, I think it really sings. And why, why does this, why does this sound familiar to me? Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We do this with our customers, yep. right? When we create a success plan, right? What we're trying to do is we're trying to achieve alignment and, and we're trying to achieve a desired outcome. And some of the most, most powerful customer success plans are those where we can tie that desired outcome to corporate objectives and, and also, and, and at the same time, make our offering very sticky with the customer. And, and I think, Andrew, um, that, that kind of relates to what I think about around empathy for as customer success leaders, you should be empathetic to your peers in other organizations who also have a critical mission to accomplish. And I think if you really want to gain allyship with other leaders, you really, you really under, need to understand to that point of the customer success plan, understand what their goals are, you know, try to uh, surface those things. I should, obviously, there's general goals you can ascribe to most sales organizations or most of marketing organizations and support, um, but it would be benefit you to actually have a conversation with them and understand the particular, peculiar, particular goals that they're after um, so that you then can perhaps you know, offer some gifts to them and say, you know how we can benefit you right. in achieving your mission? That's the best way to kind of lower the walls, lower the temperatures and start gaining allies, I think. is, And, and that's you know, related to kind of thinking about them as a customer um, and having a success plan for that. Exactly. I mean, this, we're, it's the same muscle that we're using with our customers, right. right? Employing empathy to understand their perspective. We teach that in our training, the importance of, you know, uh, aligning and communicating effectively with folks and other organizations starts mm -hmm. with the same thing that you're doing with your customers. It's more work. But, it is. You know. Alex asked a pretty interesting question um, in the Q&A. Um, how do we communicate with leaders in the topic who are in charge of sales, right? Um, and I think, you know, that's often a place where we as customer success teams experience the most friction, right? Um, we are both concerned with the customer journey, you know, sales tends to own the front half, we tend to own the back half, or, you know, there's some, there's some collaboration there. Uh, and I think, you know, if you kind of take what we're talking about here and how to speak the language, right. And how to find common ground, um, you know, sales folks tend to be quite concerned with revenue, right. It's, it's sort of, if it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense. Right. And so with them, you know, how can you begin to speak the revenue language of that customer journey, right? How can you kind of, you know, craft a combined mission that, ties together from the customer standpoint, what it means to be introduced to your business as a prospect, and then to kind of, you know, be onboarded and, and successful. Um, I think that there's a similar needle to thread there with sales. It's just, you have to sort of um, ad adopt their mindset for a moment, which is going to be really revenue centric, and then figure out how from a missioning standpoint, you can bridge that gap. It's a two-way street though. In, in my current situation, I have the privilege of owning both customer success and inside sales, but in past experiences, yes, you have to speak sales lingo in, in order for them to recognize without revenue, in order to achieve revenue, there has to be adoption and engagement and continuous value that's reiterated by way of educating, right? So if we work together to try and create the best customer journey possible for our shared customer, we'll both reap the rewards of revenue and adoption engagement, which reduces churn at the end of the day, right? So again, trying to get comfortable in fighting that meet and merge component with your sales counterpart or your sales leader, it's not easy. I kid you not, it's not easy. But once you find that synergy, it does eventually become easier. Well, it's a, it's a different mindset, right? Uh, sales is a very transactionally focused mindset. They're incented, and it has to do with incentives as well. Mm -hmm. They are incented to process sales as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Yeah. Right? But it, 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 in order for the unit economics to work in this business, you have to, you have to also be aware and be cognizant of the fact that if you send a bad fit customer 
our way, that it's going to take away from the good fit customers. It's going to, it's going to uh, challenge our ability to provide the type of value realization activities that we need to provide to all those good fit customers. Right. And, 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 you know, and I, I also think that uh, what I found to be effective is yes, you've got to, you've got to approach your sales counterparts with the what's in it for them, mm-hmm. the with them. Right. But you also uh, need to help that you need to educate them and help them understand why getting them in the door is an important piece of the puzzle. But you know, the whole play here is about customer lifetime value and increasing customer lifetime value. And that, you, you make it very difficult to do if you just throw somebody over the over the fence with uh, poorly set expectations so you could just so you could close a deal that's right and and I one of the things I was really most proud of when I was at Oracle was I um, was able to heavily influence the um, the curriculum that salespeople consumed um, on how to sell oracle products and i did that by just building really good relationships within this really large sales academy inside of oracle i had some really good contacts and and they trusted me um my kind of industry knowledge and they brought me in to the actual design of the sales curriculum that they were teaching salespeople about post sales and the whole point of the customer life cycle so i made sure that the language the right language was was inserted that the right kind of depiction of the of the life cycle was was, was laid out and what all the important considerations are for customer success to be able to do its job. Sales people need to do the right things in the front end. And so I think that was beneficial, that strategy. Now, there, there's also a piece of this, though, that you know, we, can't, we can't gloss over. We need to, it's super important to have a sales leadership that, you know, that gets it, right, that understands this and and also is incented in the right way. Uh, I've worked with a number of organizations that uh, where, where we've included a component of the comp of their comp structure that is tied to uh, time to value or uh, or renewals or or what have you with a sliding scale uh, where we're still giving sales something for bringing in the right fit customer. We I've even been in situations where we've created um, uh, organizational pods where you would have sales and success working together and they would to jointly own a book of business uh, and, and everybody shared in the responsibility of bringing in the right customers and growing them. Right. So, I mean, you need to, I, I personally have been in situations where you are like this with sales and it's a, it's a really difficult to really challenging situation to be in. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, from, from my experience, just you got to be patient. Uh, and, and, and you have to be the one that makes the first move. You have to be the one prepared to educate and prepared to educate them using data points and in their language and from their perspective. I think all of those things that you were just kind of ticking through, Andrew, the way that comp, comp plans gets adjusted, the way promotion criteria work, um, you know, even sort of the, the profile of people that get hired, you know, into an SDR function and promoted up through the org, like all of those patterns are ways that you can sort of walk the walk on that partnership. I think when you talk about mission, mission can sometimes feel a little fluffy. It's, oh, it's like just words or whatever. But I think, you know, mission is what should guide us. And then, you know, kind of policy changes like that, like, oh, we have a six month clawback or, oh, we have a three month adoption, like, you know, commissions clause or something. Those are ways that you can tell that actually your mission was really effective because now it's been sort of solidified into policy and that is going to work as you scale up. Uh, And so I love seeing organizations that as they scale, sort of, you know, figure out the relatively few but powerful leverage points of policy that you can use to really drive home like the mission in terms of metrics and individual performance and individual incentives. Like that's the sign of, I think, a really high functioning kind of mission statement when you can translate it into policy and then grow with it. 100%. I think it's super important to be aware of what your counterparts in the sales and marketing and engineering and products departments are expecting out of the CS org, right? So as you start to craft your mission as a new leader, um, you know, understanding what is it that they are seeking from the customer success team in order to help them do their job well. Because at the end of the day, we're all working towards extending the lifetime value of all of our customers. It is our customers that give us this livelihood and this privilege of working for them. And I think that has to be a constant reminder as you start working and branching out with your counterparts 
is that I'm here to listen. That's what CS does. And I'm here to apply to help us move forward better. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be hesitant or scared to make the first move ever. Yeah, you, I think that, uh, yeah. that word braver, I think of customer success as needing to be brave. And you said it, Audrey, don't be scared. I don't think there's a choice. I think because of its prominence as the customer kind of advocate within a company, you can't sit back. You actually have to be brave about taking the first step in these conversations. But you know, and I think we actually, sorry, go ahead, Michael. We actually have a lot of examples of what happens when you do sit back, right? And that's when you become the everything team. You know, if you think about, um, you know, one of my favorite documentaries, Office Space, a movie from the 90s, you know, there's a scene where we're talking to these guys and they say, you know, we talk to the customers, right? And, and there's not really a definition around what that really means. And I think, yeah. you know, if you don't be a little brave, um, you know, be the first one to extend uh, the hand and kind of um, the olive branch, I think you end up in a place where, you know, you, CS teams become marginalized from a mission standpoint. And that's not good for anybody. It's not good for customers, not good for business, not, for, not good for employees. And on the long term, you know, really great, I think, legendary businesses are really, really good at customer success. And that that's not by accident, right? It's because they're able to, CS is able to broker those deals. Um, CS is able to be put at the center of the drive and the growth of the company. Um, and that, you know, that forms really durable, successful businesses and the names that, you know, we've been hearing about for, for years and years. Like those are the good ones that we want to work at, that we want to be customers of, uh, want to own stock in all of that. But as you, as Michael, as what you, as you mentioned in, in our, in our kickoff call, right, there's, there's effort that needs to go into that to determine that lingua franca that can be used universally, right. To, to let's cut, you know, I, you, you need to put forth that effort and really think about how can I come up with this kind of common, language across the different teams to help people understand why what we do is so important. Yeah. And, and that, that takes time uh, and you have to be really disciplined about it and, and you have to build up a great examples of what you're doing with customers and, and document that stuff, figure out how to do that, build up a kind of a, a mechanism for being able to turn it around and use it as internal kind of uh, proof points to advance your argument for building these stronger uh, relationships with other organizations that you need to keep sustaining um, in order to uh, really deliver the outcomes. So, so that's a, that actually leads, leads us to uh, a, another question that I have is, you know, how, how do you explain or demonstrate the benefits of working closely with, with, uh, with customer success to other departments? I mean, maybe you're in the process of, cause it does take some time to come up with that, that mission statement. It's not, you're not just going to, you know, close your office door and on a Friday afternoon and come out and say, okay, I've got it dialed in. Right. So how de, separating the emotion from the facts is super important and, and showing up with data is super important. How have you done it in the past? Who wants to go first? Go ahead. I'll go. Um, so I like to use this analogy that customer success is the middle of a bicycle wheel where that, that middle spoke and everything else is kind of moving along and all the other departments are, is the wheel, right? And so yeah. customer success, again, to use lingua franca to make sure that everyone understands our perspective and our mission is, again, applying where we relate to them. If I'm at the top of the funnel and working with the marketing team, customer success affects acquisition because we can go ahead and provide all of the feedback that we're hearing as to why people are signing up for the platform or the service and why they wanted to partner with us in the first place to help accelerate the top of the funnel. When it comes to education, working with product on the most frequently used or undiscovered parts of the product to help people navigate through the product to be successful is, is key. Like the value, why we have bugs in the first place, communicating the engineering like, this isn't working and this is why people need this feature to be working so quickly because it needs them to, it helps them get their stuff done it's their livelihood right and then of course with sales it's that expansion opportunity we help uncover any expansion opportunities that the sales team could be going after to land and expand right and so as everyone moves around us customer success with one phone call with a customer can impact all four departments that need to pivot based on simple feedback that we've collected simply because we chose to listen. And we're dang good storytellers in conveying why it's so important to each department. 
Right. So, and, and so how does that, but see that's, and I'm going to throw something controversial at yeah. you. I a hundred percent agree with you. And I actually use the bicycle wheel, uh, awesome. analogy myself all the time. Uh, but, uh, then, then how does that keep us from being viewed as the everything department? Well, again, it comes back to having that clear mission statement of why we exist, what we're here to contribute and what is, what is it that they need of us for, to receive the most value? Is it our input? Is it our connection? Is it um, the testimonials we receive? What is it that they need of CS in order to move their job forward or the business forward? So wait, customer success is responsible for ensuring that customers are getting value uh, from, our, from our products and services and for our organization to get value from our customers. We're the channel of value. We're the we are value the channel, channel of value. Yeah. 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 Love that. We inspire value. We educate on value. We reconvey. Like everything is value, value, value. Awesome. I think uh, when, I, when I think about the sorry, go ahead. The I think about making you know writing the mission statement right, um, and you're totally right. It's not just going to happen on a Friday afternoon in isolation, right? And I think in particular for me, why it, that's that doesn't work is because if you develop a mission statement for any department without the context of the company's broader mission statement into which you sort of need a ladder um, and without the context of your peer groups in sales and, and product or engineering or anything, like those all need to be coherent and rationalized together. And I think honestly, the most important one is laddering into the company mission. And so, you know, when I work with businesses that have a, a really strong sense of purpose in CS, but a really weak sense of purpose as like a business, that's kind of a flag because it's like, oh, hold on a second. You you really want to be a you want CS to be a differentiator. Your mission statement is all about differentiating in the market or something. Uh, that's great, but it it sort of is um, it's on an island, right? And it's, yeah. it's it's isolated because it's not tied into the company mission statement. Personally, I've been really lucky to work at companies that have a really strong sense of purpose um, and you know can kind of frame that corporate mission really nicely, and that has honestly made it quote unquote, easy to make the CS mission statement. But I think in a world where you as a CS leader do not have a clear sense of that company mission in your head, the first thing you need to do is clarify the company mission, not sit down to write a CS mission statement. Correct. And, and I think, Mike, if, if that goes badly, if you don't get that right, there's a risk to your employees' well-being, I think, because I think people want to go to work and do something impactful that's meaningful, that makes sense. And if they start detecting that the work they're doing isn't aligned with the company, they're going to like feel badly about that. And they're not going to, they'll probably still try and do the job really well, but they're going to not going to see the results. Right. And I think that's when you start suffering as a leader of people who are kind of disengaged, and maybe leaving. And so I think, you know, it, it, you're spot on. You got to make sure you nail that, that piece that's got to be tied to the corporate piece. Yeah, that's the worst thing that you can do is have uh, employees that just seem to be doing what they do from muscle memory and not because they have a passion. Yeah, that's just a failure of leadership. Do. Okay. It is a failure of leadership, 100%. Um, why don't we jump into some of these questions? We already answered Alex's. Alex, thanks for the question, by the way. And and also, um, uh, on the out outcome-based selling on our website, we have a whole uh, description of what that, that program entails. So... Uh, uh, and, and we're also happy to answer any questions uh, on that. Um, let's see. Our next question comes comes from Todd. Uh, Todd asks, our organization has a customer success team, but upper management seems to want our account executives to do a lot of customer relationship developing after onboarding instead of the CSMs because they seem to see our roles as more customer support than customer success. How would you describe the difference between each role and the importance of CSMs to managers who don't seem to truly understand the value of the role? It's a great question. Who wants to jump in? Anybody says, else? Just I'll, 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 I'll bite. Yeah, okay, go for it. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think to uh, Audrey, what you said about kind of the, the hub, CS being the hub and the spokes. I think, you know, CS is a function that it exists because and with other functions, right? In isolation, you know, without the product and the rest of it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't really work. So I think what that means then is that CS 
you know, is a little different at each company, right? And in some organizations, CS is going to own certain things and others, it's going to own others. And some sometimes things they're going to go to onboarding or account management or, you know, all, all sorts of different roles that are really dependent on the way your product or service works. So when I, when I read something like what uh, Todd's written here, um, which is about, you know, uh, CSMs versus account management versus other roles, like I think that the, the right approach is really a, a kind of practical and process-based one, not a kind of mission and, you know, let's climb this hill type thing. It's like, let's just get down to work and figure out how, how these pieces fit together. Like I would get a whiteboard or a virtual whiteboard and kind of do a swim lanes exercise with those other folks in account management with, um, you know, the executives that you feel like are making some of the decisions that are impacting your team. And I would put the question to them, like, what's our, what are our swim lanes? Who is responsible for what? And, you know, where do we have redundancy? Where do we have folks that are, you know, kind of think they should be doing a certain job, but maybe that's not actually on their plate or it's moved, right? I think doing that swimming exercise is a very useful kind of tactic to clarify the process and ownership. And once you do that, you've actually created space to have the higher level mission conversation. But if you're sitting there, you know, on a day-to-day basis, feeling like you have collisions and your swim lanes aren't clear, it's going to be very hard to, you know, to reap the rewards of some of the mission and the stuff Peter was talking about in terms of motivation and everything. Like, uh, you got to clarify the roles, responsibilities, and swim lanes first, I think. Yeah, and I would say just to kind of, for me to conclude on that, Michael, I totally agree. Make that, make that session really powerful by challenging everyone in the room to articulate which, what, are, what value are you bringing every single interaction with the customer? And if people have a struggle um, explaining what the value is from a customer's perspective, then you should really call into question, okay, is, is that necessary? And who should be doing that? You know, uh, I think that goes back to Audrey's point about the, what's called the hub of value. I think that's really powerful to keep in your mind that if you keep the value of the customer in, in you know, center of, of everything, then those swim lanes should be a lot easier to kind of like, you know, paint uh, for everybody and get everyone on the same page at that session. Yeah. Everything we do needs to be outside in thinking, right? We need to be thinking from a customer's perspective. I mean, we have to think from our, I mean, we, we have to understand from our own business perspective, what makes sense as well. And there's actually a question about that uh, as well. Uh, but yeah, I love the swim lanes idea. Uh, also, I'm going to drop here in chat. I've dropped it before, but in case you haven't uh, been to one of these, uh, is our customer success uh, engagement blueprint, which is a racy diagram tool to kind of lay out all the tasks and figure out who all the stakeholders are, both internally and externally. Um, and, and it's a great, uh, because it's done on a Google sheet, it's a great way to lay out what it is you're trying to you do and what you're trying to achieve. Uh, and ensure that uh, everybody understands what everybody else is doing. Uh, so I would uh, welcome you to uh, download a copy of that and use that uh, with your own teams. Um, Audrey, anything to add to, to Todd's question? or um, No, I agree with both Michael and, and Peter. The only thing I would add is, you know, transactional conversations are very different from value education type of conversations and there are specific skill sets that each individual has, you know? Um, And I think it's up to each organization to create those swim lanes and identify where each handoff process should take place. So again, not one or all organizations are never the same when it comes to CS. Right. So true. All right, Todd, thanks for the question. Um, by the way, just a reminder, we do go till 15 past the hour. So if you have to leave at the top of the hour, totally understand, but we'll go as long as there are, are questions in the queue or we'll go until 12, 12 15 Pacific. Uh, Jesus asks, for you, what are key actions for starting a CS culture? Um, for example, set up a slideshow to showcase in a general internal meeting. What, 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 if, what have you all used previously uh I, i've actually done something very similar to that very very rudimentary early in my career is just to get up in an all hands meeting and say hey i want to understand want you to understand why i'm here and understand this team that i'm building and uh and and throw it out there for any questions that anybody has uh it, it's not it's not from my perspective not, not wasn't one of the most ideal approaches but we're talking i, I started doing this back in 2008 when customer success wasn't really a thing outside of Salesforce. 
Uh, so that's well, all I had, all I had on me. Yeah, the way I, I've done it before and the way I think about it is uh, CS is no different than any other business function. And all business functions um, have been birthed from a need, um, whether it's product, sales, support, everybody, everyone creates these things because they're trying to fill a gap. And the probably the most powerful way to, to establish a CS kind of pres or uh, idea in a company is to say, we have problems with churn. We have problems with retention. I mean, we talk about that so much in our CS community. It feels like a cliche, but it's real. And, and customers are bleeding off companies all the time. And so if you're serious as, an, as a CEO, you want to understand how to fix that. And so that, as a CS leader, you have a fantastic opportunity to present a business case in front of a large audience as to why you and your, your nascent organization are the right is the right entity to kind of address this. Yeah, I think customer success is still very new to organizations and companies are still trying to figure out, like, do we need customer success right now? And typically they do, but it's at the very end when they start realizing, as Peter said, there's a churn problem or an adoption problem happening with the product. And I think, you know, in my experience, I've always been with companies where CS was never prominent or didn't exist. So taking Andrew's experience, getting up there and saying, I'm here to be the voice of the customer and be representative of our customer base is just a great way to start. And I think that that sends signals out to the rest of the organization that the company is investing in our customers because we are building out a team now that is hyper-focused and laser-focused on understanding the pain points of our customer base. Right. Or the opposite, what's working well and what's resonating well so that we can amplify and scale that movement. Right. And so I think you just being present in a culture that is starting fresh with customer success, Jesus, is speaks volumes of your organization. Right. That's that's the big gesture for it is is representing the customer base by having a department coming up, you know, in in CS is, is huge. I think, Jesus, there's also um, there's an opportunity as you kind of seize that stage and kind of take the spotlight for a moment there to be specific and focused in what you're going to accomplish. Um, I think in a world where we as CS leaders stand up and we're like, hey, like we're here and we're, we're going to help, right? That, that starts to step us down that path to being the everything team. I think in, a, in an alternate world where we say, hey, you know, we have real issues with customers churning after the first year in our S&B segment in North America, like, you know, make it specific, take it down to something that is like, you know, uh, focused, right? When you do that, you, you define a problem that you actually are capable of solving, right? But when you stand up there and you just sort of talk about customers in a general way, I think that, you know, it can be good. And I think there's, that storytelling has a really good place. But I think when it comes to making that statement of like what you're going to deliver for the business and you have that stage, you want to be as specific as you really can be because like it might be that it's a renewals challenge this year. It might be that it's an onboarding challenge. It might be a support challenge. And all of those can sort of roll up to customer success. But communicating your focus in that way, I think, sets you up for a bigger win down the road. And also, you know, to fight again another day. Like, you're not going to be able to solve all the world's problems, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in, in the next quarter. You're, you're going to accomplish certain things, and then you're going to change your priorities and accomplish those next things next. Especially if you can bump move the needle, if you could say you can move the needle on renewals by 10% or something like that. I mean, you get a lot of nodding heads and, and that sort of thing, right? Or you put oh, some numbers. And we talked about, Mike, you mentioned that one in our, in our prep call about how, you know, yeah. when you're talking to sales, for example, where you can say, hey, listen, I, by, 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 by reducing our churn by X percent, which I truly believe we can do by implementing these policies, I can actually get us more money so that you can hire more people. Yeah, I think, you know, there's an interesting kind of uh, tie back here to a previous conversation, right, where we said, look, try to speak the lingua franca of your business when you develop your mission, Um, try to relate to your peers, you know, talk a little bit of sales to sales, talk a little bit of engineering to engineering. Um, Something I found works well in sales driven, you know, high growth VC backed cultures is to translate uh, from a from a dollars and cents perspective, translate what is a point of retention worth in terms of sales reps, 
is that worth a point is worth two sales reps. Like if you add up the productivity for those reps, um, you know, what is, what is 10 points of renewals over the course of the year actually worth to us? What would that do to our ability to succeed as a business and, and to grow faster? Um, that's a really powerful way in a lot of, you know, kind of intensely growth uh, oriented cultures to translate CS. And I think, um, you know, in, in co- into common language. What was that data point that uh, Byron Dieter from Bessemer mentioned a few years ago in his state of the SAS about how a improvement in retention of just a couple of percent can dramatically improve the valuation of your organization? Anybody know that exact not statistic? Not I, I know what you're saying. But do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. I mean, these... These things that we do to increase customer value realization, to increase retention, once again, like to your point, Audrey, being the cog in the middle of that wheel, have an effect on on everything. I mean, we really do. And that doesn't mean that we're the, the everything organization, but the, but the actions that we take, the actions that your customer-facing teams uh, and activities your customer-facing teams are focused on have a, have a demonstrable and measurable in, impact on the success or failure of your organization, right? The success is, and that success comes from everybody embracing that and being customer focused. And the failure comes from people who just don't get it and don't take you seriously and think that you're just customer success, just a checkbox because the analysts want it or the street wants it or, or what have you. Hey, Zeus, thank you for that question. Um, let's move on. Uh, Paige asks, uh, Paige, thanks for the question. Paige asks, it would be great to hear your thoughts on how we balance our customer needs versus our business needs. I I mean, that's, um, I don't know how easy that is. Yeah. (laughs) That's where it it depends, right? I'm I'm trying not to be really glib, but I I see the customer's needs as the business needs Mm -hmm. because if, if you don't address the customer's needs, you're not going to have a business. I mean, that's yeah. maybe exaggerated, yeah. but I, th- I don't think it's too exaggerated in today's business climate. And especially with cloud and SaaS, things move super fast. Mm-hmm. And if you don't get that right, um, your business could be at risk. And we see it all the time. Um, large companies too. I mean, like I look back at, at uh, RIM, uh, Research and Motion Blackberry, they were just, they didn't keep their eye on the ball. And Apple just came up and just, took their whole business away from them really fast. So um, I think I don't see it as a balance. I actually see it as the customer's needs should reflect your business needs. Yeah, and I, I think if you... Go ahead. If you feel like the two are, are really out of whack, right? Not just like a little... Not, not just like a little friction, which is kind of normal, right? Because they are different, right? But like they're, you know, opposing forces and you feel like yeah. your team as CS caught in the middle. I think there are probably a couple of places to look and to say like, huh, is this something that we as a business need to rethink? And can CS sort of help set, shed some light on it? I think one place is your pricing and your packaging, uh, in particular, how your price scaling works. If you're not really doing a value driven kind of pricing, you're doing something more ex- extractive where, you know, you just prices just go up because as opposed to customers getting more value, I think that's a pretty interesting place to look that can cause this kind of divide to be felt as a CSM where you, you, know, you have to levy these huge price increases at every renewal term, but you don't really feel like you feel guilt about it as a CSM because you are empathetic to the customer and you realize it doesn't match the value. I think pricing can be something like that. Uh, I think sales compensation plans that we mentioned before can be another place um, you know, that you can kind of... Uh, identify some of that friction and again, use your um, storytelling and your customer um, kind of empathy to shine some light on those two places. Those, those two tend to be, in my experience, where a lot of that friction of like, ooh, it feels like the business is asking us to do something that the customer doesn't want, um, tends to originate from those commercial origins like pricing and, and sales uh, comp. Yeah, and as I read it, you know, customer needs by way of feature requests, like if you are seeing feature requests or bug issues transpire in a part of the business that you know the business is not currently moving toward at the moment, then of course there's misalignment there on the types of feedback that's being collected and disseminated across the organization, or the organization is not listening closely enough to the customers from the very start when they crafted the roadmap um, or what they choose to work on in terms of feature improvements. So, 
You know, if you can, if you can kind of see based on feature requests or comments made during your conversations that you're like, huh, it doesn't quite align with the direction of our business where we want to be at. That's definitely, you know, a, a place for you to step up and say, here's a red flag. This is what our customers are saying versus where we want to go. Um, but you have to look at that within, you have to look at that in aggregate of your entire customer base, right? Definitely. If it one or two people, one or two customers, that's kind of hard to even definitely to, to sell that idea. But if you've, you know, Hey, 40% of our customers are saying this and we're not focusing on it. That's a significant amount. And that should be part of the story that you tell, right? When we go, when, when, when we're trying to kind of uh, get people aligned, it's like, you need to be able to go in and say, Hey, 40% of our customers that make up X amount of revenue are asking for these things to get done. And, oh, yeah. and so if you're okay with, kind of leaving them, if you're okay with losing this revenue, you know, at some point in the future, because we don't address it. Okay. But you know, we're, we don't seem to be addressing us, you know, a, a measurable uh, cohort of our, of our customer base. Yeah. And this is where that data analysis, part of your brain kicks in. Can't, can't really avoid the data and what it tells us, but yeah. you know, if, if you're willing to let go of a couple of customers because it just doesn't jive with your business, that's, that's an okay decision and you yeah. should be okay with that. Yeah. Right. So Agreed. Yeah. And you should do it in a, do it in as, as friendly as a way as possible. Hey, we're not going that direction. We yeah. totally understand that you want to, we will help you transition to another vendor. If that's something that's important to you. But yeah. Once again, yeah, it's all, it very much in, 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 it depends. Paige, thanks for that. Uh, David, by the way, uh, chimed in and chat a 2% improvement in retention increases company value by, 10%. That's pretty, pretty freaking significant. So that would be Byron Dieters. Uh, That's standpoint. Byron Dieters. Yeah. And you know, just on, on that point about Byron, who's fantastic. Another guy who's fantastic and talks about this a lot is Jeffrey Moore on uh -huh. LinkedIn quite a bit. He talks about the value, like the value of customer success. And so it'd be worth checking him out too. Yeah, for sure. I think one of the one of the really interesting uh, while we're down this garden path, like one of the really interesting things that happens to customer success as the business grows, as your install base grows, you know, customer success is a much bigger point of leverage for a hundred million dollar revenue business than it is for a one million dollar revenue business. Like in a, in a smaller business, it's kind of operationally easier to just hire in some more sales folks and you know go make some more leads and just just roll it in the roll it in the front door um, but once you're really underway you know you're a big business you've raised a lot of money you're a public company got lots and lots of customers lots of revenue you know that's where a, that really small uh, delta in retention and customer behaviors can have a really outsized impact. And so if you're with a smaller company that you're planning on growing with as a CS leader, like just know that over the next, you know, couple of years, as that company succeeds and grows, like your role is actually going to get increasingly bigger over time. Uh, and that's actually a lot of fun um, because then you get to start using these numbers and they really paint the picture of how important CS is as you, as you grow and continue to accrue revenue under management. Awesome. Um, uh, Kathleen asks, how do you differentiate customer support from customer success? This is a common point of confusion for my company. You know, I, I, I myself answered this question, you know, real simply is, you know, customer support is, is transactional and it's, and it's uh, reactive. Uh, customer, customer success, on the other hand, is all focused on value realization, understanding your, uh, your, your company, your, your, your customers and, it's a much more proactive set of, of motions. Any, anything, anything, uh, uh, the, I would any, just, the three I would of just, you weigh in on, on that? Yeah, I would just add to what you were saying, Andrew, about the, the classic differentiation. Uh, and just let everyone know that too, that there's a lot of support organizations themselves trying to transform the way they do their work now uh -huh. and incorporating AI and trying to do, you know, machine learning and, and to identify patterns that they can um, get ahead of. So in a sense, they're trying to become more proactive and that's all great for everybody, right? Um, and, and even if they do become excellent at that and they are able to kind of lower uh, case counts because um, they're able to help product become better and, and, and they're helping the customers kind of avoid um, problems, there's still going to be a, a big need for the business value driver of customer success. You know, support will never do that because they're meant to fix technical issues. And that's the rightful lane. 
And so I see it as there's, there's um, a clear delineation. Uh, success should never be fixing technical issues because that's not their expertise. That's not their mission. It should not be their mission. And, and so uh, for me, I mean, this is a conversation that, yes, it's, it's still common in our business, our community, but I hope it's, it's kind of waning. I would like to see it kind of like go away because people should understand that there's really distinct roles here. Well, I think the profile for somebody in a support role, we're talking about people who are uh, triaging issues, you know, break, fix management uh, is, and, and once again, reactive waiting for stuff and waiting for stuff to happen, even with it, with AI, even if we have some predict predictability there, the, the, the people that you're, that you're, you want to hire into these roles is all about, okay, I need to, I need to break down this challenge that this customer has. And I need to come up with a, with a solution. Whereas in customer success, right, we're, we're, we're depending on, on, on an understanding of the product and some, an understanding of the customer and some business acumen to connect the dots between um, uh, uh, creating solutions out of something that may not even be there or helping the customer to, uh, you know, achieve a solution that they, that they desire. And it's, 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 it's a different mindset. It's a different muscle, right? Something that I've found is like a, a trick you can sometimes use here, um, depending on who you're talking to, where this question comes from. Sometimes this question just comes from someone that's like, you know, just trying to kind of make a pedantic uh, argument and like just yeah. kind of, you know, poke at you a little bit. Okay. W one way to handle that is to sort of, you know, handle a little Socratically. Be like, okay, so what's the unit of work for support? And what's the unit of work for success? I, I think the answer to that question is the unit of work for support is a case. What do cases do? They get open, they get closed, they kind of, you know, they ping pong back and forth, they get escalated. And when they're closed, they're done. Cases are effectively transactional objects that have a beginning and an end. Um, conversely, in success, the unit of work is not a case. Like we might use things that are transactional from time to time, just in the way we do our work. But the real unit of work is the account. It's the customer. It's the it's revenue, success right? plan. It's the, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's just a totally different kind yeah. of thing. It doesn't have an end. And yeah. because of that, it needs to be treated really differently. And that's, you know, the role differences, the mindset differences, the everything. Like to me, that that has that structure of the work has a lot to do with the support, open, ping pong, closed, and success doesn't have the close, or hopefully doesn't. Yeah. No, no, we don't want that. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, so, Andrew, there's a couple of questions early on that we may have skipped. <clears throat> Gary uh, asked one at the beginning about. Um, I've, or, I've, or, I've ordered them based off oh, of upvotes. So. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. No, let's go to Gary's. Yeah, I know Gary's been sitting patiently. So. Yeah, I mean, I could. I'd like to just to address that because I have some experience with this. Yeah, you, let me uh, let me uh, let me read that for everybody. Sure. Gary asks, "I'm on the I'm on a brand new CS team that is made up of industry SMEs being converted into CSMs. How can we as Individual contributors help to drive home the need and image of success to the other teams who are ingrained in their habits and possibly view us as just customer service. So, Peter. Yeah, that's a, that's a really challenging one because you probably, the SMEs, subject matter experts, probably have a really great reputation for getting stuff done, uh, fixing things, and people um, have, you know, refer to them as rock stars and all that wonderful stuff. But then the business wants them to change, of course, because the business understands uh, they want to be able to drive value for the customers. So how do you, and some people might say, well, you can't switch these people. They're just different kind of personalities and, and roles. And that might be true. But my experience is talking to, working with SMEs and helping them evolve to more of a business kind of value um, proposition is not impossible. Actually, a lot of them embrace it. And they are proud of their technical prowess but they would like to figure out with you how they can kind of apply it for more value for the customer. And the customers are okay with this. Um, it, you know, it's, it's really more of a kind of a personal kind of conversation they should be having with customers. And I know your question, Gary, is what about within the company? Well, that's, that's for the leaders, frankly, to help kind of clear the landscape for. Um, have those conversations, position the SMEs appropriately, and the SMEs can do that too um, and just remind people. It's like selling customer success to the company. And now the SMEs have to sell their repurpose, not repurpose, kind of 
um, enhanced or evolved role. And it just requires them to kind of step up and, and be equipped with the right language and hold fast, I think, to it. We have a lot of teams, we have a lot of, of, of customers that come to us with these types of subject matter experts. They're hiring people out of industry who can speak the language of their customers and they put them through our training. So they mm -hmm. learn that kind of baseline foundational customer Very success well. training. But, you know, it, I, I have found in my, you know, in, in, in my career last couple of decades without getting specific, uh, subject matter experts, um, turning subject matter experts into customer success managers can be incredibly powerful to an organization, right? You, you, because, you know, what's our, our, our ultimate objective is to help the customer create, a, uh, to achieve their desired outcome, to, 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 to help them generate value. Who better to be able to do that than somebody who can very much relate to and talk to yeah. those customers? Yeah. That subject matter expertise is incredibly powerful. I had a guy that uh, when, when we were doing recruiting that wanted to get out of finance, he's a head of finance. He says, I want to get into customer success. And I said, well, what do you know? And he said, well, I'm, 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 I've, I've done this uh, budgeting, forecasting, and planning thing. I do it every month. I do it every quarter. I do it every year. I happen to have a client at the time that was a budgeting, forecasting, and planning uh, 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 company. And, uh, and I sold him on the idea of, of interviewing with them. And I, and I had to really push them to interview him because – they said, no, we need somebody who's been a customer success manager before. Yeah. And, and I reassured them that this guy would, would show up and he would very quickly become one of their, their top CSMs. And, uh, and, and I told, I told, told the, uh, told, told my, uh, my interviewee, my, my candidate that, uh, that, that I would expect him to be promoted within a year, uh, and really own this place based off of what he known, what he could bring to the table. He actually had he had actually implemented this software a couple of times, a couple of different companies. He showed, wow. he, so I, he gets hired and a year, almost a year later to the, to the day that he got hired, he emails me. He says, you know what, Andrew, you're freaking right. I, uh, I just got promoted. I took my boss's job. I now have three CSMs working for me and I have the 25 biggest accounts mm -hmm. within my book of business, you know, and it had everything and it was everything to do with that subject matter expertise and being able to establish a connection you know, with your customers, super important. Great. Yeah. So don't, don't underestimate the value and the importance of that subject matter expertise that you bring to the table, Gary. Uh, Peter, if you can hit the done button on that. Thanks Gary for that, for that question. Hey, Audrey, Mike, do you have anything else to add to that before we, we move on? Nope, not from my end. Awesome. Um, and then we got another one here uh, that uh, Peter wants to jump in on. And by the way, you, I want you to, to weigh in on this if you want to weigh in on it. It's a great question. Actually, it's it's timely because I've had some conversations recently with some partner organizations about how how we can help enable them from a customer success pr perspective. How can a CS team interact with customers who may transact through a channel partner? Uh, it's delicate, I think, because you need to respect your channel partners. Uh, they are an extension, in a way, of your business, and and you know maybe you're not even their main client in a sense. So, you know, I'm thinking of the large systems integrators. I mean, you might be really small, so you need to be really diplomatic and careful that you do want to impact the customers at the end of that process. And so the best way is actually to set up some sort of a program that can help the, the partner um, align better with, well, not better, but align with your customer success philosophy, what you want to do with the customers and, 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 you know, how, what your general principles are for driving success for customers. And you can provide examples of how you do it direct. And I think my experience is the partners are, they would welcome this. I think um, oftentimes their customer, the partner relationships can be a little bit kind of distant because they don't necessarily trust you um, and they don't give you all the information. So it's like, it's like any sort of relationship. I think you have to wear down those kinds of uh, barriers and lower them to build a really good relationship with the partner to the benefit of the customers. What I don't think you should do is go directly to the customer. I think you'd always need to engage your partner, channel partner, to make sure that the, you get the clearance because in, in, in the end, that's their customer, not your customer, even though the customer is buying your product. So you have to kind of respect that business relationship, but there's definitely things you can do to enable the customer success through the partner. 
Yeah, in my experience, I work closely with our channel team and we work almost hand in hand with any new opportunity that comes through our channel partnership channel. Um, and not I'm not I'm never the point of contact, but I'm there to provide support for my channel sales managers who may need some extra guidance on how to, why to, and when to use something within the product or within the service that would benefit the channel partner that they're speaking with. And so I'm always in that again, in that supporting role as a success you know, leader in making sure that they see the holistic picture of why it would benefit being partners with one another. It's just some insights that channel may not have a pulse on, you know, in as near real time as success would, which is why we complement each other so well. So um, that's my approach to working with channel. Yeah, I, I think you have to start with like, what is the, you know, what is the relationship to that partner? Are they a value-added reseller? Are they a, just a pure pass-through reseller? Like, like what, what are they doing, <laughs> right? And, you know, in a lot of cases, they're going to be selling your product or service, but wrapping it in something else and kind of repackaging it in some way. Mm-hmm. And I think when that happens, that often changes the kind of value chain and the, the point of the purchase from the end customer. And in, when that happens, which it often does in, in partner, um, partner-driven partner sales, it does require a different approach um, than your kind of direct normal customer success. So I think like like Peter and Audrey are saying, like, I also like to have a kind of partner success, you know, center of excellence, then the customer success center of excellence. They might share a lot of stuff, right? They might even share people to a certain degree. Um, but I do think that they tend to require different kind of approaches because mm-hmm. the value chain is often just so different in partner land from direct land, even if they're using the same tool, the same support team, mm-hmm. same knowledge base and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, we we um, we have a, a one of our larger customers that their partner success team approached us and said, we, we see how much overlap there is between just our customers, what our customer success team is learning and what our partners need to learn that we're going to actually offer as part of the certification for partners. We're going to offer to put them through your program to learn the the basic elements of customer success, right? So, and they're going to pair that with a partner success manager who's going to be able to, you know, uh, deal with the connective tissue between what they're learning from a customer success perspective and how to apply it to their their customer base, but it's super important to support your partners, right? Because at the end of the day, you're, you, whether they're whatever partner they are, whatever kind of partner they are, value added reseller, channel part, whatever. They, at the end of the day, your customer sees your logo, mm-hmm. right? So if they're not getting value, they're not getting value from your logo, right? Regardless of who installed it, who configured it, who sold it to them. Um. Awesome. Great. Uh, thank you for that uh, question. Um, who, who asked us that? I know. I, I hit done. I, can't I don't know. I, yeah, I know. It's all right. Uh, <laughs> it was a good one. <laughs> it was. It was a good one. Um, uh, Renee asks us, uh, I work in biz dev and we are constantly in touch with our CSMs when it comes to a client inquiry. Having them in touch with the clients help us to identify new opportunities. And when we have meetings with prospects, we love having people from CS because they bring real client experience to the table. Okay, so this is really not a question. It's more of a statement. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Okay, cool. Thanks, Renee, for that. Uh, Macon asks, what should be the top three focusing points when building a CS team from scratch? Like scratch, scratch. Sure, sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I'll, maybe I'll start off on this one. I mean, I, yeah. I had the uh, I had the for- the fortune of working at a company that scaled from you know uh, like double digits of millions in revenue to you know uh, to to deep hundreds, right? And um, that journey involves a lot of like rearranging teams and kind of, a lot of the kind of things that we've been talking about so far. Uh, then after that experience, I had the experience of going from pre-revenue to, you know, to just single digits and millions of revenue. And I got to tell you, it's totally different. Um, and, you know, while a lot of the mindsets and the things that we've been talking about today are like, they're, they're good, right? Um, I, I do, my personal take on it is that 
you know, when you're really, really a young business, um, you want everybody to be really deeply involved in, in the customer. And, you know, what that means is getting as many like engineers and product people and, you know, CEOs, founders in touch with the customers as possible. And that means that the customer success motion from the customer standpoint is just going to look really different at the very beginning. And you really need your founders in there because if your founders aren't talking to your customers, like your business isn't going to go anywhere. So when you say scratch, that makes me think of true day zero. And that's really founder led um, success. And probably the first hire is, you know, somebody to begin maintaining like a support queue. And it's probably more support that than success um, focused. And that's, for a variety of reasons, um, one of which is that you probably don't really know the life cycle yet because your product, your service, and your value chain is just sort of, it, it's like, it's so new that they haven't been able to identify some of the patterns yet. So I think it's founders first. Um, and then I think it tends to be support. And, and after that, often onboarding, uh, even prior to success. But support or it's, or, it's a, it's a, or it's a hero role, right? You're doing everything, yes. right? Yeah. I mean, there, there's a certain capacity. It doesn't make sense for you to you have to reach a certain scale w before you start uh, specializing uh, those activities. That's now, Audrey, right. you had something to add? Yeah, no, I was going to say, you know, yes, I, when you start from scratch, you tend to take on more of the supporting role, the hero role. But as you start to realize all the patterns and trends of all the types of inquiries and questions and kind of stuff that's being thrown your way, you can then start weeding away, okay, this is more of a reactive role versus a proactive role. I'm here to establish something more proactive that we can build upon. So it is necessary to go through those motions. There's, there's no BS in that. You have to go through that motion if you're starting from scratch. And so I would just take everything in stride and document, right? Document everything and just use that data that you've documented to make the best decision for your particular organization at that time. Awesome. Thanks for that question. Um, uh, Iman asks, how do we quantify the value that CS provide is providing other than that the renewals and upsells and cross sell numbers? Well, advocacy, I think, is an obvious one. Um, yeah. You know, the, the big attraction for people in marketing would be customer references, uh, of course. And um, uh, NPS? Yeah, NPS. Yeah. NPS. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Okay. So I, yeah, I, qualified leads, something like that. What do you think, Mike? You were going to say something. I think I think all those are awesome and things that CS certainly like influences and and can move in addition to the revenue um, yeah. renewal numbers. The the other place where my mind goes is you know if you are a more mature organization and you have a really good sense of the leading indicators of those renewals, whether it's product usage or, you know, some other kind of activity type of thing. Uh, and you can take specific actions that, you know, improve the state of those leading indicators on a per customer basis. Like, Oh, you know, a customer that, you know, we can get to, use these features by this amount of time into onboarding is going to, is going to renew at this rate. Then what you can do is instead of only talking about the lagging indicators, like the renewal and the upsell, you can talk about the leading indicators, like the adoption, um, the, the pacing of uh, that customer's journey and things like that. That requires a pretty like strong muscle, uh, pretty high confidence around the data that's going to predict those lagging indicators. But I think that's a really, really important muscle to develop because as you grow, you're going to need to, to have that certainty. So you can focus on those leading indicators and you just have a much faster crank time and iteration time on, on um, your ability to influence those than you do every month, you know, halfway through the next month when the book's closed, trying to count up your renewals. And those are hugely interesting to the other organizations, product and, and support, people like that. Right? Yeah. Here, here's a question from uh, from one of our one of our uh, uh, partners, Shai, uh, Shai asks, when choosing your next company, which questions would you ask to make sure this company has a CS mindset? I would just ask, I think I would ask, um, can you describe your voice of the customer program? It's a loaded question for me. <laughs> I have a preferred answer. Yeah, I would, I would ask, you know, how involved is customer success in um, quarterly planning, roadmap planning? You know, yeah. how, frequent, how frequent do they meet with the builders of the organization, your engineers and your products? Like how much face time do you get to cross collaborate with each function is telling for me. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm right there with you, Audrey. Like, where does CS live in the org today? And where does the CEO want it to live? And if CEO doesn't have an opinion. That's a sign. Um, that's a sign. And, but I just think, you know, again, a lot of small organizations, it's, it's a different time, a different place. But then a lot of them hit some point where they really want to, like, they, there is a desire to have a better CS mindset. Maybe they don't know how to do it yet. Um, but, you know, if they're looking to hire a chief customer officer, if they're looking to, you know, have that CS seat at the executive table, then all of the good stuff we were talking about kind of at the top of the hour in terms of mission can come to fruition if CS has a seat at the table. Yeah, I think my question would be around how, how, how does sales perceive customer success, customer success's role in the organization? Because a, a lot of the challenges that we face in customer success, uh, uh, many of them can, can come from misset expectations, in, inappropriate handoffs. You know, which makes our job that much harder. You know, we 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 want we want our customers uh, when we show up for that initial kickoff call to be very excited, uh, or to leave that initial kickoff call very excited. And if if we have to reset expectations, if we're asking the same questions over and over again that they've already answered because there hasn't been a good transfer of information, uh, that that makes it that much harder to get started and going off in the in the right direction. Um, so shy, thanks for that, uh, and thanks for being here. Um, there's some other questions in here, but, uh, we're running a bit out of time. Um, I want to see. Uh, uh, let's see. I want to find some stuff that's a little more. I've got a few things in here on driving adoption. Really not, not related to this. Um, how how it's different? So Khalid asks, how is it different uh, to transform a company into a CS function than managing an existing CS function? You know, are there going to be startup playbooks to take from there, or external consultants is the only way? That's an interesting question. So I've got I've got how do I transform? And I I, I myself have, have acted as a consultant uh, in in a number of situations where um, you've got a company that is. Uh, traditionally reactionary, customer support focused, on-prem, and they have made an acquisition into the cloud and they now need to change kind of the way that people approach and think about uh, uh, supporting their customers, uh, especially because pretty much every company has some sort of subscription-based uh, uh, vendor these days and, and they've, they've been given a taste of what customer success looks like. Any yeah. thoughts, suggestions yeah. on that? I mean, I, I could quickly say I've had experience in both scenarios and it's a lot harder um, to do that on your own as a CS leader or organization to, to change the company's kind of mindset. It's, it, it's possible. It depends on the size of it and it might take forever. Um, but I've also been in a situation where we've hired external consultants and that was more successful. And I think it's simply because the executives were the ones who made the decision to bring them in. Yeah. And we worked with the external consultants. They were dedicated to customer success organizations. So we we're tightly aligned with them and working day to day with them. But they were the ones kind of like doing that a high level clearing of the path. And that was much more successful. Yeah. Awesome. Mike, Audrey, anything to add before we wrap things up? I just think the, the common thread there is the executive focus, right? And I think that's woven through all of today's conversation. Yeah. Uh, with CS as a seat at that table, it works. When you can speak the lingua franca of your executive team and your company, it works, right? And a lot of that is kind of just, you know, how central to the strategy is it? It's like Shai's question too. You know, how do you know a CS organization um, versus one that doesn't care? I, I think a lot of that has to do with executive leadership and the importance that they place on the customer and therefore on the CS organization as a, as a piece of that puzzle. And that leadership starts with you. So be your biggest evangelist and, yes. you know, continue to storytell and bring it up as much as possible. Take every opportunity when you have that platform to remind folks that, you know, customer centricity is okay. And that's why we're all here today. Right? Awesome. Yes. Audrey, that was a perfect awesome. wrapping that this <laughs> discussion up in a bow. That was <laughs> awesome. So we're at the, thank you. We're at the end of our webinar. I think it went well but it's not what I think it's what all of you think. So please let us know by posting your feedback on LinkedIn uh, and tagging us. I want to thank my amazing panel of guests for spending the time with us today. I thought this was going to be a great conversation from our prep call and it, it turned out to be. Uh, so, so we very, we all very much appreciate you making time in your schedule 
to provide your insights and best practices that you that you share. One final note, great, great CS leaders know that they don't have all the answers, but they know where to get them. That's why we created the CS Leadership Roundtable to harness the knowledge and experience of the community to help everyone improve. Uh, so we hope you got something out of this uh, discussion, and we'll see you at our next event on March 16th when we'll be talking about infusing empathy in automation with uh, Bertel Wheel, uh, Josh Rosenthal, and Laura Lakawahara joining me. Check out successcoaching.co to find out more and sign up until we see you again. Have a great rest of your day, week, and month. Stay safe and stay healthy, everyone.